one and all to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday rundown of all the latest news concerning Starship development, upcoming rocket launches and upcoming historic spaceflight anniversaries, as well as a reflection on all the launches and news that we saw happen last week. I'm going to just quickly address the elephant in the room here. I do sound a bit croaky today, but I've not got COVID or anything, don't worry. I've been recording a lot of commentaries for various projects this week, and it's taken a bit of a toll on the old vocal cords. And hey, Make sure you're subscribed and have notifications enabled using the buttons down below so that you get to see these projects once they're finished. Subscribing also ensures that this news show appears in your feed when it's published, meaning that the following information is up to date and correct, rather than being a few days or weeks out of date. Anyway, I think this intro has dragged on long enough. Let's move on to our first segment, all the spaceflight news that happened last week. In terms of orbital rocket launches, there's not a great deal to discuss regarding last week, as we only had the one launch. It was on the 29th of January and was a Chinese Long March 4C rocket, which launched from the Huiquan Launch Complex. On board were three Yeogen Chinese reconnaissance satellites, which were successfully deployed into low Earth orbit. Now, just because there were no other rocket launches doesn't mean that last week was completely devoid of news. On the 28th of January, NASA conducted the first hot fire in a new series of tests for the RS-25 engine, an engine formerly designed for the space shuttle that has been upgraded for use on NASA's massive upcoming space launch system, or just SLS, on future deep space missions. Moving along to Boca Chica, SpaceX have been making progress with their Starship. The prototype everyone is watching right now is the SN9, which will perform a high-altitude flight to around 10 kilometers in a similar fashion to the SN8 though hopefully with a slightly softer landing this time. We unfortunately saw a few attempts last week, but no launch. The first attempt was on Monday the 25th, which was then scrubbed and moved to Thursday the 28th, where everything seemed to be going to plan. But then the Federal Aviation Administration apparently wouldn't permit flights to proceed, prompting this tweet from Elon Musk, implying that it seems to be government bureaucracy that's keeping the SN9 on the ground, rather than the vehicle itself. The third and final attempt of the week was on Friday the 29th, but once again no flight took place. However, unless anything changes again, we may not have to wait too long for the next attempt. It's today, February the 1st, so we might only have to wait a few hours to finally see the SN9 soar. Watch this space. X. Sorry, that was terrible. Brendan's latest Starship infographic shows where we are with the other Starship and Super Heavy prototypes. The little SN7.2 there underwent thorough testing this week. This prototype is made of 3mm thick steel, as opposed to the 4mm thick steel used on previous Starships, and SpaceX will be presumably testing it to destruction in order to validate the thinner material, which if successful will enable huge weight savings across an entire Starship and Super Heavy assembly. To illustrate what a complete Starship would look like, Here's Eric and Small Stars' latest excellent render of the vehicle. This particular render shows the Moonship variant of the rocket, which, as the name would imply, will land astronauts on the moon. Beautiful work as always, guys. If you guys want to watch the full video, there's a link on screen and in the description below. But back to the SN7.2 again, so far it's not been confirmed what pressures the tank will be pushed to, but Elon has confirmed on Twitter that initial testing has been a success. The SN7.1 was tested to 8 bar before destruction, so presumably this is the ballpark pressure that SpaceX planned to push the SN7.2 to. Back to full-scale prototypes, the SN10 was completed last week after its aft flaps were attached, and wanting to waste no time, SpaceX rolled it out of the high bay and on to a second launch pad right next to the SN9. This is an incredible sight to see. Two Starship prototypes both preparing to launch in such close proximity, and when adding the SN7.2 to the mix, this is three Starship prototypes all together and completed, ready to undergo testing. Though the SN10 can't quite fly yet, as it will need to undergo cryoproofing before the three Raptor engines can be mounted. But SpaceX's rapid progress with development really is a feat of its own, and I have no doubt we won't have to wait too long to see the SN10 flight ready. In sadder news, we saw the SN12 undergo disassembly last week, making this the third prototype, along with the SN13 and SN14, to be cancelled. 
Presumably, this is because SpaceX found that major modifications would be needed following the acquisition of the data from the SN8 flight, and that it would just be easier to scrap the prototypes rather than upgrade them, and shift all focus to the SN15, especially considering that we still have the SN9, SN10, and SN11 to conduct test flights in the near future. Elon Musk confirmed on Twitter that the SN9 to 11 would only feature minor upgrades over the SN8, but the SN15 would see major improvements. Exciting times ahead, I'm sure. But we'll leave our Starship coverage at that for this week, but we may have some very exciting news to discuss on next Monday's episode if things go as well as SpaceX hope this week. Before we move on to the next segment, if you're enjoying this video, then do please remember to leave a little like down below. It really helps us stay above water in the algorithms of YouTube. And once you've done that, you can sit back and relax to the next segment or the launches planned to take place this week. On the 1st of February, today, we should see the launch of the next SpaceX Starlink mission. This was delayed from the 27th of January, and hopefully everything with this launch is now sorted, and we'll see the mission succeed today. The Falcon 9 will launch from the Kennedy Space Center with 60 Starlink satellites on board. The first stage will attempt to land 633 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, and the fairing recovery ships Ms. Tree and Ms. Chief will be attempting to recover the fairings. Hopefully, SpaceX will pull this one off as effortlessly as they always seem to do. Tomorrow, on February the 2nd, we'll see a Soyuz 2.1B take off from the Plasetska Cosmodrome, carrying a Russian Aerospace Forces military intelligence satellite. The Soyuz is one of the most reliable rockets in the world. In fact, there's a good argument to be made that it's the most reliable, so I would hope that this will go ahead as planned without any unexpected delays. On the 4th of February, SpaceX will launch another Starlink flight. I'm not going to really talk about this one, there's no need to repeat myself since I literally only just covered the previous one. This mission will follow a similar profile to Monday's. The 5th of February will see China launch their Long March 3B-E rocket, which will carry their Tianhui-3 Earth Observation Satellite into geosynchronous Earth orbit, capping off this week's launch schedule. Now, next week does look quite lonely, actually, as the next planned launch after Friday's Long March flight is another Soyuz 2.1 on the 15th of February, meaning we'll have a whole week without launches. That is, unless, of course, we see any unexpected delays in this week's schedule, or we may have a Starship flight to look forward to if we don't get a hop this week. We'll always have anniversaries to talk about, though, which brings me to the final segment of the video, a rundown of all the most interesting historic anniversaries relating to spaceflight coming up over the next seven days. You may notice my voice suddenly improves. It's because I recorded this segment a few days ago when my throat wasn't quite so sore, so that's why there's a sudden... It will change, like, that, that's, that, that might, you might notice that, I'm just, I'm just saying. The first anniversary of the week is today, and unfortunately, it's not a very happy one. On the 1st of February 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated during re-entry of mission STS-107 into the Earth's atmosphere, resulting in the death of all seven astronauts on board. The launch of the mission took place on January the 16th, and as such, I covered the Columbia tragedy in a fair amount of depth in space this week for January the 11th. Spaceflight disasters involving loss of of human life are never very nice things to talk about, especially considering we also covered the Challenger and Apollo 1 disasters in last week's history segment, so I'm not going to discuss Columbia in much more detail today. If you want to learn more about the tragedy, then there's a card on screen you can click, or alternatively you can navigate to the Space This Week video from January the 11th using the playlist link in the description. On Wednesday, February the 3rd, we'll see a few anniversaries. First up, in 1966, we had the successful landing of the Soviet Union Luna 9 probe, the first spacecraft to make a soft landing on the moon and the first spacecraft to take pictures from the surface of the moon. The landing was achieved with a contact sensor that touched the ground while the lander was approximately 5 meters above the lunar surface, which triggered the shutdown of the descent engines and ejection of the landing capsule. The capsule hit hit the ground at 22 kilometers per hour, bouncing several times before coming to a rest in Oceanus Procellarum. Luna 9 was the 12th attempt at a soft moon landing by the Soviet Union, so I'm sure it was a relief to see this iteration succeed. The craft only had one scientific instrument on board, a radiation detector, which measured a dosage of 30 millirads per day. 
However, the mission did determine that a spacecraft would not sink into the lunar dust and that the ground could support the weight of a lander, something I'm sure the Apollo astronauts greatly appreciated. We'll talk more about their escapades for a later date this week. Now, Lunar 9 isn't the only moment in history to celebrate on the 3rd. It's time for a rapid-fire Space Shuttle Anniversary Rundown. February the 3rd, 1984, STS-41B is launched using Space Shuttle Challenger. This flight is notable because it was the second flight of the European Space Agency's Space Lab pressurized module and the first with the Space Lab module in a fully operational configuration. Furthermore, the mission featured the first untethered spacewalk performed by astronaut Bruce McCandless, pictured here performing said spacewalk with the manned maneuvering unit in this now iconic photograph. Fast forward to February the 3rd, 1994, Space Shuttle Mission STS-60 is launched, carrying Sergei Krikalev, the first Russian cosmonaut to fly aboard the shuttle. The mission used Space Shuttle Discovery, and it carried the Wake Shield Facility Experiment and a Space Hab module into orbit, and carried out a live bi-directional audio and downlink link-up with the cosmonauts aboard the Russian space station Mir. Fast forward again to February the 3rd in 1995, we have Space Shuttle Mission STS-63 once again using Space Shuttle Discovery. This flight is notable because this was the first rendezvous of the American Space Shuttle with Russia's space station Mir, and during the flight astronaut Eileen Collins became the first woman to pilot the space shuttle. The mission also carried the first Coca-Cola dispenser into space. It dispensed pre-mixed soda for astronauts' consumption and studied their taste perceptions. Astronauts rated control samples before and after flight. On February the 5th, we'll get to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the 1971 moon landing of Apollo 14. The Antares moon lander managed the most accurate Apollo moon landing to date, touching down a mere 26 meters from its target. Touchdown was in the hilly uplands of the Fra Mao crater, about 110 miles east of Apollo 12's landing site. The two astronauts, Alan Shepard and Edgar Mitchell, traveled more than half a mile from the lander, conducting selenological investigations, collecting samples, and attempting to reach the rim of Cone Crater, approximately 90 meters above the landing site. They collected 42 kilograms of rock and soil for return to Earth, and the samples were scheduled to go to 187 scientific teams in the United States, as well as 14 other countries for study and analysis. The liftoff of Antares from the lunar surface took place precisely on schedule, and it rendezvoused with the command module Kitty Hawk successfully, which then splashed down safely in the Pacific Ocean on February the 9th, exactly nine days and two minutes after launch. On February the 6th, 2018, SpaceX's Falcon Heavy made its maiden flight. Its little brother, the Falcon 9, features prominently on this series. There's a lot more demand for medium lift launch vehicles, but the Falcon Heavy is certainly a force to be reckoned with as well. I genuinely can't believe it was three years ago since this flight. I'm sure most viewers of this channel remember it well too. To recap what I'm sure doesn't really need to be recapped, the massive rocket took flight, carrying Elon Musk's Tesla Roadster and Starman a dummy pilot in the driver's seat, on board. The rocket was comprised of three Falcon 9 first stages, the side boosters jettisoned shortly after launch, touching down together on adjacent landing pads in what is undoubtedly one of the coolest looking things I have ever seen. Unfortunately, the central core didn't stick the landing quite so well, only one of its three landing engines ignited, and it smashed into the water at 300 miles per hour. The Falcon Heavy for this flight was all white, as this was prior to SpaceX's deployment of the Falcon Heavy Block 5, the most recent iteration of the rocket that sports the black accents we're all now used to seeing on the Falcon 9. The Falcon Heavy has flown three flights to date, all of which have been successful, but so far none have been able to recover the central core. The first and third flights had the central core crash into the sea, but on the second flight the core actually managed to land successfully, but then it subsequently fell over during transportation back to land due to heavy seas. The next Falcon Heavy flight is scheduled to take place later this month, on the 28th of February, so here's hoping we'll finally get to see all three boosters come home safely. Our final anniversary is on Sunday the 7th of February, which marks the date in 1979 when Pluto moved inside Neptune's orbit for the first time since either was discovered. Not much more to say about that one really, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. Anyway, I think that's a pretty comprehensive overview of all the most interesting pieces of history with anniversaries set to take place this week. 
And that's a wrap on another episode of Space This Week. Wow, lots of anniversaries taking place this week. And hey, you may have also learned from our history segment that a fourth Falcon Heavy launch will be happening at the end of the month as well, provided there are no unforeseen delays, of course. That's a flight to look forward to, but then again, with the rate that SpaceX are progressing with Starship down at Boca Chica, that launch may well end up getting overshadowed by the SN10 performing a high-altitude flight. That might be a slightly ambitious goal, though. We're still hot on the SN9, but then again, the SN8 only flew in December. It's barely been any time at all, so there is every chance that SpaceX will start accelerating the time between liftoffs. For now, I guess all we can do is speculate and admire the end screen, which has now materialised before you. You know how this goes. The link to the left is a link to the full Space This Week playlist. The right is a video chosen for you by YouTube. And there's links to support the channel, either by subscribing or supporting me on Patreon. And of course, don't forget to follow me on links below to Twitter, Instagram, Discord, etc. Anyway, I'm going to sign off now. Bye!